Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me again today. Uh, may you be blessed in your viewing of this and other videos in this series and in your meditation upon the content. So my name again is G. Bruce Greer. I'm the author of this book that we're using for the series uh, titled Introduction to a New Covenant Understanding of Atonement, subtitled Replacing Old Covenant Based Theories of Atonement. And as I go through this and other videos, I'll be referring to the book and giving you page numbers in the book if you care to follow along in the book. So let's begin with our opening prayer, which is found in Ephesians 1, uh, 17 through 19. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you'll know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power towards us who believe. Amen. So now this uh, session, we're in chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7, again, is one of the longer chapters in the book, and so I'll be breaking it into two parts. Uh, both of them have to do with historical development of atonement theory in the church. This part A and I'm going to give you uh, some introductory remarks, is dealing particularly with the three cultural streams that influence contemporary theologies. So it's by understanding these cultural themes that will also help us and understand how the theories of atonement developed in the church. So following along uh, on the screen in this video, we make a significant shift in the introduction to a new covenant understanding about one meant video series. In the first six chapters, I laid the foundation in scriptures for adopting what I've called New Covenant Onement and proposed as a total replacement of Old Covenant-based theories of atonement. So the pivot we're making in this chapter 7 is moved from the scriptural basis for New Covenant Onement to looking at the history of atonement theories in the church. This will help us shed some of the harmful and misrepresentative theories of atonement that have become dominant, particularly in the Western church. The Contemporary atonement theories, as we will see, were not dominant in the early church and have been formed and adopted along cultural and geographical lines and not along biblical revelation, as understood through the scriptures given to us in the original through the Hebrew authors with the Hebraic biblical understanding, which is quite different than either the Romanized or Hellenized influences that crept in over the centuries and still are dominant in contemporary Christianity. So in part seven, A and B, I'll often be quoting third party authorities far more than I have in previous chapters. While I feel confident in my 50 plus years of Bible study and accumulated revelation in my own statements and opinions regarding scriptures and scriptural interpretation, as we move into the study of ancient cultures and history of atonement theory in the church, I will of necessity yield to those that have made these matters their specialties far more uh, and have far more knowledge in these fields than I have. Finally, I feel to mention that in the space of about an hour each for chapters 7, A and B, I can only briefly touch on the things I do cover more thoroughly in my book, so I refer you back to the books, my books in the series, uh, for greater value. So as always, may the Holy Spirit guide you in the matters of revelation uh, that he has for you. Now, also, we're gonna, I'm going to be touching on in this series, the next two, this chapter, chapter 7, uh, things that might uh, cause you some trouble depending on your identification with certain parts of the body of Christ. So I have four caveats that I'm going to begin with. Caveat number one is don't take this politically. This chapter, chapter 7, is not intended to speak for or against conservative or liberal politics. Rather, I am describing theological doctrines and practices identified with portions of the body of Christ as sometimes either being conservative, which you'll see I identify with Roman and Pharisee roots, or liberal that have Greek and Sadducee roots. These theological leanings should not be confused with political leanings. Christ himself was apolitical, leaving temporal things to Caesar while fully recognizing the overarching sovereignty of God over all the earth, including over governments and mankind, ultimately to be fulfilled in his coming kingdom. So now, caveat number two, don't take this personally. As we will see, while Jesus warned his disciples to beware of the teachings of Pharisees and Sadducees, and we'll cover that more, 
Jesus did not say to beware of people who were Pharisees and Sadducees. He even ate meals with and encouraged them to come to faith in him. Therefore, we too must be careful to distinguish between people's beliefs and the people themselves. A third caveat, caveat three, be careful when applying generalizations. Generalizations, while often useful, can be misapplied or misleading when applied to specific individuals or specific cases. So in this chapter, I'm gonna be making uh, many categorical generalizations about cultures, especially when I talk about Greek, Roman, and Hebraic biblical cultures, and the effects of those cultures upon contemporary Christian church, generalized as being conservative or liberal Christianity. These are generally, but never perfectly true when applied to individual Christians, churches, denominations, or circumstances. So let's just be careful in how I use generalizations and how you apply them yourselves. Number four, caveat number four, however, do take Jesus' warning seriously. I have sometimes found it challenging to see and apply Jesus' warning about the teachings of Pharisees and Sadducees within the context of participating in the body of Christ. However, our loving Lord, who is full of grace and truth, John 1:14 still felt and spoke strongly when warning and confronting both Pharisees and Sadducees with the truth. So by the grace of God, may we do likewise. And so with those caveats, and I hope you'll keep those in mind, not only uh, through the whole series, but particularly in this chapter seven. Now here are my goals for chapter seven A, and they'll be on the screen. And again, reminding where this chapter, we're looking at the three cultural streams that influence contemporary Christian theologies. Number one, to come to see how contemporary Christian theologies, practices, and beliefs have been misled through cultural influences going all the way back to those seen in the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' time. Two, to see that many of the human ideas about God seen in the Pharisees and Sadducees were filtered through and extended through two other cultural geographic roots that would be extended into the Christian church one being Roman, and we see this largely in Western Christianity, and two, Greek, largely in Eastern Christianity, or Greek, uh, or the Orthodox Church. Number three, to see these cultural and geographical influences continue into contemporary theology as being a conservative Christianity, which shares much in common with Roman pharisaical roots, and in B, into contemporary liberal Christianity, which shares much with Greek and Sadducean roots. For to bring us individually and corporately back to a Hebraic biblical Christianity as best understood and seen in the early Christianity, particularly we'll see in Ephesus where the Apostle Paul, Priscilla, Aquila, Timothy, and Apostle John all lived and taught at various times, largely influenced by the gospel of grace that the Apostle Paul taught. Number five, in this session, chapters part seven, part A, to provide a broad, broader basis for understanding what we'll cover and 7b, that is historical development of atonement theories in the church up to contemporary times. And six, lastly, to open your mind and spirit to receive a new revelation that the Holy Spirit can use to bring us into the full stature of the mature body of Christ that the Father desires for us individually and certainly for all of us corporately. And with the Lord's help, may this be so. So now as we move into chapter seven, here's an overview of this chapter because we're gonna be going into some deeper weeds about these three cultural streams. So uh, number one in seven A and B, we'll walk through the historical development in the church beginning in part A with these three cultural streams that have influenced our theologies. Two, we'll see how these theologies beginning in the early church from a Hebraic biblical diverged into the pre prevalent contemporary theologies as influenced by Western Roman and Eastern Greek secular cultures. Three, we'll see how contemporary conservative theology exhibits a mixture of the Roman cultural tendencies and these continued even after the Reformation in the West. Number four, we'll see how contemporary liberal theology exhibits a mixture of Greek culture and philosophy that is largely continued in Eastern Orthodoxy and is making a resurgence in some, resurgence in some Western theologians. Five, these di directions divert from the original Hebraic biblical foundations of the earliest church, as we've said, in, as we've seen in the Pauline epistles, the book of Hebrews, and the Jonah 9 gospel and epistles. 
And six, we'll compare and contrast the ways of thinking that characterize these three cultures. That is Hebraic biblical, which I identify with authentic Christianity, the Greek culture, which I have identified with contemporary liberal Christianity, and C, the Roman culture, which I identify with contemporary conservative Christianity. So in the next video, chapter seven, part B, we'll look at historical development of atonement theories. Now that's the history of it. From biblical times to the current era of atonement confusion based on those uh, cultural influences. So eight in the next vi vi video also I'll conclude in illustrating how the more comprehensive and biblically correct New Covenant one model overcomes the faults and omissions in the other historical models or theories of atonement based on either Roman or Greek cultures rather than earliest Hebraic biblical culture. Uh, now I want to first uh, come into and even ask the, a good question is why is the biblical perspective necessary? Uh, and you'll see on the screen uh, how I have explained this. Contemporary theology is a result of a long line of messages translated from two different languages, that is the Hebrew and the Greek were the original languages of the Bible, into a third language which we are, is ours, the English, and this happened, the, these translations happened over 2,000 years and through very different cultural lenses. Uh, so let me share with you uh, a story. I think it's uh, anecdotal, but not necessarily true, but makes a point that I want to make about uh, cultural lenses. So there was a story about um, a sheep herding Bedouin who was uh, moved from his native land to New York City. And uh, he was shown the entire city and all the marvels that we experience in this contemporary and modern world. And then he was brought to his uh, uh, condominium building where he would live, brought up to his condominium unit and shown all around uh, the wonderful things we have in modern society. So after all of this, he was asked the question, well, uh, we're gonna leave you now, so do you have any questions for us uh, that we could help you with? And he said, yes, I just have one. Uh, where do I keep my sheep? Now, if you get the gist of this story, what it's saying is this Bedouin who is so familiar with and grounded in and grown up in a culture where sheep were the primary means of sustenance, food, and the very heart of their culture, I had a hard time comprehending uh, life in this different setting. And so we too, when we come to the Bible, or Christianity, we bring it with it uh, to varying degrees, not, all, not necessarily just cultural, but also personal and family and other perspectives uh, that may need adjusting, I would say really all need adjusting to come to understanding the full truths of what we find in, in the New Covenant One Month. So as we go through that, we'll, uh, uh, you'll maybe keep that picture in mind, help you realize that you may, there may be areas where you are a little bit blinded. So uh, now in, my, um, in this chapter, I refer back to a book that I've written. It's available also on uh, Amazon.com called um, Neither a Pharisee, Conservative, or Sadducee Liberal B. And uh, so in that, this refers back, we're just gonna cover the heart of that, which is found in all three gospels. And I'm gonna refer you now to page 225, and you have the references there in the three uh, synoptic gospels. And uh, this one that I'm gonna be quoting from, I believe is the Matthew 16, uh, six, and then 11 through 12. Uh, this, so this was Jesus warning to be wary of the teachings of Pharisees and Sadducees, quoting the, Jesus now. And so Jesus said to them, his disciples, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, it's not here in the text, but the disciples mix this up that he was talking about the bread that he just used to feed the 5,000. But then Jesus now says, And how is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they, that's the disciples, understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now briefly, <clears throat> you might have been heard in the past that leaven is a type 
typology of sin, but if you look at the use, and I don't have time here to do it, leaven is, a, is, a, is something that brings out and puffs things up, and it can either puff them up uh, with good or bad, and in this case, Jesus is talking about being aware of those teachings and thinkings and belief systems that were, he's identified with Pharisees and Sadducees that can come in and actually uh, become the whole loaf. So now, uh, I've alluded to this earlier, but on page 225, here are those roots that we're going to be tracing. We're going to see the commonality between what the Pharisees taught, uh, seen in the Roman, similarly to the Romans, and certainly carried forward into much of contemporary Christian theology. Uh, number two, the Sadducean beliefs are very similar to much that the Greeks held, and also similar to the contemporary liberal Christianity. And then finally, that heart of where the biblical writers came from was a biblical, a Hebraic biblical background. And we see this in all the early apostles uh, and their writings, and in, particularly in the church at Ephesus. And I believe that's the foundation for New Covenant Christianity. So uh, here's a quote <clears throat> you may, may not realize this, but this is where the study of history helps us in coming to see that some of the things we may feel are long-held traditions may not, uh, may not go all the way back to the earliest authentic Christianity. So on page um, 227, here's a quote that way back uh, early in the church history, there were three theological schools and streams. So reading that quote, according to the new Shaft Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, uh, that's published in 1912, over the first 500 years of Christian history are records of at least six theological schools. Four of these schools were universalist, and you can see the cities. One taught conditional immortality, that was in Ephesus, and one, uh, the last one, taught eternal hell, and that was uh, in the two Roman cities of Carthage and Rome. Now, I'm going to relate that to our current topic now by reading you from my book, page 227, this discussion of the three early theologies following these three cultural geographic lines. These three schools of theology developed largely along geographic and cultural lines. The group described as universalists were Greek centers. Those teaching eternal hell were Roman while the group described as teaching conditional immortality was found solely in Ephesus, which uh, had Hebraic biblical roots as will be shown. Historically and critically, the church at Ephesus was primarily influenced by the teaching of Apostle Paul, affirmed by his disciples of Priscilla and Quilla, Timothy and the Apostle John. Of these early Christian leaders, all except Timothy were culturally Hebrews. Timothy, while born of a Greek father, also had a Jewish mother, traveled extensively with and was mentored by Apostle Paul and would have learned the Pauline gospel from himself. So he had the influence of a Hebraic biblical um, teacher as well in, in his own home. Priscilla and Quilla, who are uh, lesser known figures, but they're there in the Bible and important in the early church, were Jews who fled Rome to live and work in Ephesus along with the Apostle Paul. They also traveled with the Apostle Paul and Paul described them as his, quote, fellow workers in Jesus Christ, as found in Romans 16. And then finally, of course, the apostle John, whose Hebrew roots are well known, ended his life in Ephesus, where he would have become very familiar with the teachings of the apostle Paul, Priscilla and Aquila, and probably that of Timothy. In other words, the apostle John, and then we see this in the gospel of John, how it's so different than the others, had the full benefit of the Pauline revelation of new covenant grace, by the time he wrote his gospel and epistles. We are now going to deep dive into some of the common traits of these three cultures. We'll begin with the Hebraic biblical culture, then we'll move to the uh, Greek culture, and end with the Roman culture. And as I read these, you might consider where you've seen these exhibited in parts of the body of Christ. So on um, page 228, here are the nine traits of the Hebraic biblical culture. I'm just going to briefly touch them here, and then I'll come back and give a brief uh, comment on each. So number one was of covenant, two was of corporate identity, three was of ongoing divine revelation, 
four was of the Holy Spirit, five was a passionate God, six was a dynamic versus a static understanding of things, seven was a narrative and symbolic understanding of reality, eight was a holistic uh, picture of reality, and nine, they, they understood something that we'll cover called resurrection as opposed to an immortal soul. So number one, let's just talk about covenant. And if you remember, we covered covenant extensively in uh, chapter three in the book, where a covenant from an Eastern mind, and this would be a Hebraic biblical mindset, was something far stronger than we know typically in the West, because it was a forming of a relationship that became a kinship relationship. The closest we might think of this in our culture would be that of what used to be considered the covenant of marriage, where two people became one, and by covenant, that was meant to be a, a lasting, lifelong relationship uh, where the two became one. And so that's the context of the Hebrew mentality. This began with uh, whom they traced their father back to being Abraham, who began in covenant with God through what's called the Abrahamic covenant. And that covenant was repeated in Isaac and Jacob. And then again, uh, even though the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob find themselves in Egypt, they too are still part of that covenant. So we find this on page 229. Uh, this is coming from Exodus 4, 22 and 23, where the Lord is speaking to Moses and he calls Israel my firstborn son. And I'm quoting the text now. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me but you've refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So in this reference here, even back in that early formation of, of the, what will become the nation of Israel, uh, they are spoken to as in a sonship relationship with uh, Yahweh, the God, uh, you know, the God that we know as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But Yahweh says, this nation, these people are my firstborn son. So that's clearly a uh, kinship relationship and a covenantal relationship. He's remembering in this context his people who he made covenant with through Abraham. Number two is a corporate identity. And of course, uh, this is deeply seen in the Jewish culture, which continues today. Uh, consider that um, even though I talk about a Roman culture and Greek culture, uh, those uh, particular nations uh, and peoples have, ne have assimilated out in different parts of the world and have really lost any uh, probably truly Roman and Greek presence in the world compared with the Jewish uh, culture, which has continued even to this day. But that is because through, particularly through that uh, wilderness experience and going through that and coming into Canaan, they were always, and through the old covenant law, they were to keep themselves separate and formed a very, uh, very clear corporate identity. Number three was ongoing divine revelation. Now, the reason I say this, this may seem um, secondhand to us as Christians because we assume we read the Bible and we see revelation of God. Uh, we constantly refer to it if we're biblically based Christians. Uh, so the, we don't think too much of it, but how different this was than other cultures uh, at the time that God was leading Israel. So from the very beginning, uh, they knew of a God that spoke to them not only just to the Jews, but he spoke to Adam from the very beginning, Noah, uh, and so on, and Moses, and then not only to religious figures, he spoke to individual uh, Israelites. He spoke to Mary, and he spoke to, um, uh, you know, all kinds of biblical figures uh, God spoke to. And so they were fully aware and believed in a divine revelation, uh, even a personal divine revelation. Number four, the Holy Spirit. And again, um, how can I emphasize this? But we see, particularly going back to this Old, covenant, Old Temp Testament um, period of Israel going from Egypt through the wilderness and on in the Promised Land, that they were led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was God himself appearing uh, by day in a cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. And then this very presence of God would come down and dwell in their tabernacle and ultimately in the temple. Uh, and they knew that, and there were times when the Holy Spirit would even come upon their prophets, even including 
King Saul, who is uh, you know, a type of a fleshly man. So it's part of this Hebraic biblical understanding uh, of the person of the Holy Spirit being actively involved, speaking in and through uh, human beings. Number five, a passionate God. Now, if you uh, read the Bible, you'll see the many, many, so many instances of God expressing his own emotion for his people, his own involvement with his people, and so on. Now, to capture this better, on I'm going to use a quote. It's on page 231 in your book. Here's a quote from Abraham Heschel. He's a Jewish um, rabbi uh, who wrote a book called Bathos and Prophecy in 2008. And here's how he explains he break biblical God as a passionate God. Quoting uh, Heschel, God, the God of the Hebrew Bible, does not reveal himself to the prophet in abstract absoluteness. Now, we'll see that's more like the Greeks in a minute. But in a specific and genu uh, unique way, in a personal and intimate revelation to the world. God does not simply command and expect obedience. That would be more Roman. He is also moved and affected by what happens in the world, and he reacts accordingly. Events and human actions arouse in him joy or sorrow, pleasure or wrath. He is not conceived as judging facts, so to speak, quote, objectively, again, more of a Roman way of seeing things, in detached impassibility. We'll come back to that term. He reacts in an intimate and subjective manner and thus determines the value of events. Quite obviously, a biblical view Man's deeds can move him, that is, can move God, affect him, grieve him, or on the other hand, gladden and please him. This notion that God can be intimately affected, that he possesses not merely intelligence and will, that would be Greek, but also feeling and pathos, basically defines the prophetic, and I'm identifying that as Hebraic biblical consciousness of God. So this may sound very familiar to you as you as a Christian, you've read about the God of the Bible, but when we come to looking at Greek and Roman thought, this is quite different. Uh, six, dynamic versus static. Now, let me use a quote, this is on page 233, from um, uh, uh, historian uh, Thurleaf Bowman in his book, Hebrew Thought Compared with Greek. So, uh, quoting uh, Bowman here, if Israelite thinking is to be characterized, it is obvious, first of all, to call that dynamic, vigorous, passionate, and sometimes quite explosive in kind. Now he's, he's now going to compare that to Greek. Com correspondingly, Greek thinking is static, peaceful, moderate, and harmonious in kind. You may even know the term ironic. That's a Greek term for just a peaceful, no great amount of emotion. In any event, Hebrew, a language ex exceptionally unusual in our experience, and to our manner of thinking, betrays in many respects the idiosyncrasies of the Israelite psyche. The verbs, especially those whose meaning always expresses a movement or an activity, reveal the dynamic variety of the Hebrew thinking. In addition to the above verbs, we can analyze those showing conditions or properties, verbs to which our way of thinking also express being. It is characteristic of Hebrew and the other Semitic languages that all these verbs designate, first of all, the becoming of the conditions and qualities in question. It is really more correct to say that they're dealing here with neither a being or a becoming, but with a dynamic third possibility, therefore more of an affecting. It is as much a becoming as a beginning. The distinction between becoming and being, which is so meaningful for us in the Western world, he means, and even so, more so for the Greeks, appears to have been irrele irrelevant to the Hebrews or to have been experienced by them as a unity. Now, let, that's a lot of language, and I'm going to try to recap what was said there. Uh, we in the Western world often think linearly. We think in terms of past, present, and future. Uh, we have very clearly things that are finished and completed. Uh, that's in our past tense use of verbs. However, in the Hebrew language, uh, there's less of that sense of it. So that's why, as an example, God can say, uh, let there be, and uh, a process gets centered and completed at some point in time, 
that's according to his word, but it's, it's in the Hebrew mind, it's finished as it is said, even though it's a completion may be ongoing or progressive. And I'll come back to, this is a major point that I make in my book, and I encourage you to read it if you care to, called Made or Being Made into His Image. And I'll show you briefly using this Hebrew concept compared to uh, English, our, our standard Western view of using the English language, uh, how this might affect our understanding of things. So in Genesis 126 and 127, uh, in 126 it says that uh, uh, God said, let us make man in our image. And in Genesis 127, so he made man in his image, male and female, he made them in his image. So in that 127, uh, he made them in his image. In the English translation, it would be correctly called a past tense uh, construction of that verb. And so in our minds, uh, this is a very common Western view, that Adam and Eve were perfectly made in the image of God in that end of the story. It was all done in Genesis uh, chapter 1. However, in the Hebrew way of understanding things, God could say, let us make, and that he did make, and that could be future looking, not necessarily completed in Adam and Eve, as I contend, but actually perfectly completed in Jesus Christ, who the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, says that Jesus himself is the perfect image of God the Father. So God speaking in Genesis 127 could be speaking of uh, Christ first as the firstborn of many brethren, we find in Romans 8, 28, and 29, but also then be referring to those in Christ who are being made in, by Romans 8, 28, and 29, are being made into that very same image, again, in a progressive Hebrew way of seeing things, as completed in the sense that God is at work in accomplishing it, and it will be accomplished. So I'm just trying to use that, and my book will go into the significance of what that difference in thinking can make in all of our theology and way of, of understanding things. Now, number seven, we're coming back to the seventh uh, aspect of Hebraic biblical culture, and that was a narrative symbolic understanding. And you might see this, might even think about this, how is the Bible written? Uh, perhaps as much as two-thirds of our Bible is in story form. Uh, carrying with it, in many cases, other stories within stories. And think how often Jesus Christ himself, in his earthly ministry, used parables and other stories to try to illustrate truths. And this is a very uh, Hebraic way of doing things. Uh, compared to the Greeks, who were abstract thinkers, uh, God, through the scriptures, brings us always back into story form where we can see things concretely and then go to a deeper meaning that the Holy Spirit can bring out. But uh, the Hebraic were very uh, conscious and were using narrative. And that's why you might realize that if you read through particularly the uh, book of Acts, you'll see all these Hebraic sermons that are given all begin, uh, most of them begin with a the history. They start telling the history of the Israel nation and so on. In fact, Peter at uh, the house of Cornelius goes through this long speech about it, and the Holy Spirit interrupts his speech when he finally gets around saying, and you've been forgiven. And so then the Holy Spirit jumps in, uh, and in my way of thinking, probably in the contemporary sense, he says, I'm, you finally got to the point I was reaching. But for a Hebrew, they needed to put everything in context of story and with symbolic meaning behind it. Number eight, holistic. Holistic thinking is, um, unlike we'll see in the Greeks who uh, distinct, made things distinct and separate, for the Hebrew mind, things were more holistic or related to one another. Relationship would be another good way of saying this. So we see in Genesis 1-1, uh, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Uh, heavens all, to the Hebrew mind would have included not just the physical sky and the natural universe that we think of as heavens, but also the spiritual realm. So they have already understand that God himself is God not only of the natural realm, but the spiritual realm. Furthermore, we see when we look at, um, I'm going to use the scripture, Paul, in using the same kind of logic, we'll do this. This is 1 Thessalonians 3, 23 and 24, uh, where Paul now talking about the whole man speaks of three united holistic parts. Uh, I'm quoting that verse now. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. 
That's the wholeness of it. May your spirit and soul and body be kept complete. There we have the three parts that are all have the independent nature but are, are considered the whole man without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he will also do it. We see this very same thing in uh, something that may be hard for us in a rationalistic Western mindset to understand a trinity that has Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and yet is one God. And, but see, you understand that's a holistic perspective that says all these parts, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or more correctly, persons, uh, make up the person of God himself. It's not three independent, unrelated persons, it's three persons in one. And of course, that's very Hebraic and not so much uh, Western. Uh, number nine, in the resurrection, uh, the Hebrews uh, did not think like the Greek in terms of an immortal soul. There were even Hebrews, we see that in the Gospels, the Sadducees questioned that there would be anything such as a resurrection. For them, the soul simply died at, at, uh, at death. However, uh, uh, Christ himself affirms not immortality, but there can be an extinction of souls. And we see this, this in your book is page 239, a quote from Matthew 10, 28. So here's what Jesus, he says, do not fear those who can kill the body, that would be men, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him, God, who is able to destroy, listen to this, both soul and body in hell. So uh, Jesus here is saying that God himself, there's something, the human soul can be destroyed. God himself can do that. And yet for a Greek thinker, it's impossible. The soul is immortal. It cannot be destroyed. Well, let's move on now. I've given lip service to the Greek culture. Now we're going to look at specific traits of that Greek culture. It's on uh, the screen. It's on page 240 in your book. There are seven traits that I'm going to talk about briefly, and then uh, they are these. Well, number one is individualism. Uh, two is theoretical naturalism. Three is speculative philosophy as opposed to divine revelation. Four is dualistic. Five is static. Six is humanistic. And seven is a belief in the immortality of the soul. So I'm going to come back now with each of these, give you a brief touch, but again, you may wish to read my book uh, and other books for more detail. So in terms of individualism, uh, we probably take individualism as simply a fact of life here in the United States because we've, uh, we've uh, pretty much been conceived as a democracy and we feel a high value, uh, generally speaking, for the individual. We have individual rights and all these kind of things. But this was not common until the Greek culture. And the Greeks were the first to introduce the, even the notion of a democracy, where each citizen uh, had a vote and each citizen participated in the ruling of the government. So this idealism uh, begins with, with the Greeks and then, of course, is carried forward. We see it uh, prevalently in uh, good parts of the Western culture as compared to, as we saw earlier, the Hebrews who saw themselves as part of a corporate culture. And of course, in good parts of the world, uh, many, many people are tribal or uh, uh, in that sense, they identify with a larger group than themselves uh, more than they do even as individuals. Number two, theoretical naturalism. I'm gonna use uh, this quote from, it's on page, uh, I'm not sure where it's in here. It's on page 240 in your book. And it's a quote from uh, Bruce Thornton, who wrote a book called Greek Ways, How the Greeks Created Western Civilization. So quoting Thornton here. Egyptian and Mesopotamian learning was practical, limited to solving immediate problems and serving short-term utilitarian interests. The Greeks, on the other hand, began thinking about the natural world from a more abstract and general perspective. As far as we know, they invented an explicit theoretical and abstract view of nature. Eventually, this penchant for theorizing, coupled with an elitist disdain for grubby, quote, mechanic activities, would lead to the radical idealism of Plato, in which the knowledge of the material world gained by the senses is of no account. True wisdom resided in a disembodied reason 
contemplating the immaterial permanent truths. Now, you may recognize that as being a philosopher. Uh, uh, we say sometimes a philosopher has his head up in the sky and has no sense of what's going on. Unfortunately, some people apply that to Christians when they say they're so er heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. If that's true, then we are probably following the course of a philosopher. But we realize, as the Hebrews did, that the very uh, person and presence of God is very part of this present world and that we navigate and live and move in him and that our very foundations of how we approach life actually are best grounded in him, not in some abstract notion or theory like the Greeks might do, but we have ours in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, number three then would be speculative philosophy versus divine revelation. Uh, I'm going to use a quote again, page 242. This is coming out of the book of Acts, verses 17 through 21. And this is illustrating uh, how the Greeks were thought and Paul's approach to them. So, um, following the text now in the book of Acts, some of the Epicurean and Stoic, those who were Greek philosophers, were conversing with him. That's the Apostle Paul. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. See how strange they would not even, this idea of resurrection is very strange to them. And they took him and brought him to the uh, Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Again, this is an intellectual approach, and we just want to understand what they mean. We don't want to have them affect us. Now, the writer of Acts, Luke says, now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And of course, there you can see the, um, this Greek influence of just uh, uh, spending time theorizing and philosophizing about things, uh, disconnected, of course, with possibly even with reality. So uh, moving on, uh, number four in Greek ways of cultural thinking, uh, attitudes and thinking, is that they were dualistic. And um, <clears throat> on page 242 in your book, I address what the nature of dualism is, and we begin with this. Uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines dualism as a, quote, a theory that considers rel reality to consist of two irreducible elements or modes. Now you see that in there's a separation. These are two distinct things, uh, not a unity. Plato conceived of two realms, the perfect or the ideal made up of forms or ideas, and the second realm, the natural or material realm of objects. While there was a connection between these two, they were largely separated. This notion of dualistic worlds dominated Greek thought and influenced Western Christianity. For some contemporary Western Christian, God exists somewhat like Plato's form of God in a separate realm from our own. He's there in heaven, we're here on earth, that we can visit on certain days, maybe Sundays for most, Saturdays for some, and where he may come and go depending on our prayers or religious practices. Okay, so that gives you the sense of the separation rather than the unity, uh, wholeness, and closeness that the Hebrews might have. Now, we also see this carried forward, and this is covered on page 243, in a Greek notion, which has actually become part, I, I found this very notion even in the Westminster Confession, which you might know is one of the doctrinal statements of the Reformed Church. Um, uh, a portion of the body of Christ. Uh, so page 243, we're looking at the Greek, and this is not Hebraic biblical idea of impassibility of God. My source is the Wikipedia. So impassibility describes the theological doctrine that God does not experience pain or pleasure from the actions of another being. Now, how, how we saw that earlier when we looked at the Hebrew thought of a passionate God, just the opposite of that. Some theological systems portray God as being expressive or and of emotions. Other systems, mainly Christianity, he, uh, writer uh, Wikipedia says, and I would say that's only Western Romanized form of Christianity, Judaism and Islam portray God as a being that does not experience suffering or any other emotion at all. So in 
Romanized Western Christianity, while the created human nature of Christ is mutable and passable, the Godhead is not. Again, that's a very, uh, now we understand, of course, uh, Jesus Christ himself as fully God and fully man. And though, so again, that would be more of a Hebrew notion that these two things can be combined. Number five is the static nature of the um, Greek thought. Uh, here, they, they, we've already seen this in Plato, that those things, the forms, ideas, are unchanging. That notion is unchanging in the, in the greater world, the, in his thinking, the supernatural world. Six is a humanistic bent that happens to be part of the um, Greek way of thinking. You can even see it in the nature of their gods who are all formed after images of human beings. And number seven, rather quickly, is the Greek notion of immortality of the soul. And this is a widespread notion, uh, widely held in the Greek world, and has become, I think worldwide, has become the common belief. Uh, if that is true, then there's no need for eternal life because the eternal life implies that there's something that lives on forever. And in the Greek mind, that is something that they all shared. Moving on now to the um, traits in the Roman culture, page 245, I give you these five. Number one, practical versus theoretical. Number two, ritualistic. Three, pragmatically moralistic. Four, juridical. Five, stern and dedicated. So we'll come back now to each one. This notion that the Romans, uh, Roman culture, was practical versus theoretical. I'm going to quote you, uh, this is on 245 uh, from a different author. This is R.H. Borrow, who wrote a book called The Romans. And you'll, I'm quoting him here. Throughout their history, the Romans were acutely aware that there is power outside of man individually or collectively. In other words, they believed in a god or gods of which man must take account. He must subordinate himself to something. You see there uh, a legalistic mindset. This is the clue to the Roman culture and Roman history. The Roman mind is the mind of the farmer and soldier, not farmer or, nor soldier, but farmer soldier. Unremitting work is the lot of the farmer. To him, the knowledge born of experience is more than speculative theory. The speculative theory, of course, would be like the Greeks, or divine revelation, which is uh, more like the Hebrews. His virtues, the Romans' virtues, are honesty and thrift, forethought and patience, work and endurance and courage, self-reliance, simplicity, and humility in the face of what is greater than himself. So as I read this list of characteristics, this would these are actually noble characteristics in my mind, and many, many, describe many, many conservative Christians, what they would hold as values. You can see that they're not bad in and of themselves, but as far as the Roman is concerned, these are things that we must do, and that is the Roman culture became very part of who they were. Number two, the Romans were also very ritualistic. Again, quoting uh, Barrows, this is on page 246 in your book, uh, quoting Barrow in his book, The Romans. Roman religion was a religion first of the family, then of the extension of the family of the state. The family was consecrated, so therefore was the state. To the primitive Roman, Numen, power or will resided everywhere, or rather it manifests itself by action. All that I can know about it is that it acts, but the manner of acting is undetermined. In other words, it's just important that it acts this way. I don't try to understand why it acts that way. It's enough to know that. So the activity of this power was split into innumerable named powers, energizing the action of the household with, quote, naming, that is, invocation, when prayers and offerings of food and milk, meal and milk and wine, and on occasion, animal sacrifice. The appropriate words and rites were known to the head of the family, who was the priest. Sound familiar? Words and ritual were passed on from father to son till they were fixed immutably. The formulae of invocation prayer were handed down and elaborated and recorded unchanged by the colleges. In later centuries, this is talking about Roman life, a priest could use a liturgy based in a tongue which he did not understand and the people who took part in the rites, whose meaning was only dimly apprehended, yet which meant something. 
And does this uh, sound familiar to you? Uh, we see this practice in some parts of liturgical Christianity, particularly at one time or another in the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not bashing it, but it has these characteristics. There was a time in my lifetime, if you're old enough, you may remember this, when the, when the Catholic liturgy was all given in Latin, a language that nobody understood, and yet that ritualistic act of going through uh, that Latin mass was very essential to their faith. Anyway, moving on then, speaking on other t characteristics of the Roman culture in general, uh, number three was they were pra pragmatically moralistic. Again, this is, uh, quoting Barrow, this is page 247 uh, in your book, the pragmatic moralistic element of Roman culture. Barrow says, a strong morality was supported by this cold and formless, I would call that a re legalistic religion, and the growth of morality was not hampered by mythology uh, like for Greeks. Uh, the Romans had no sacred writings beyond the formulae of prayer. There was therefore no myth-made morality to be undone. In this we see the strong moral component of the Ro Romans along pragmatic principles. A moralism preserved the family and later the state, not necessarily tied to any timeless religious revelation, such as, say, the Bible. This helps explain the unconnectedness of the outward personal morality that I've observed over my life. It may not even be biblical morality. It is more pragmatic morality. I guess I'm reading my own self here. But anyway, you can see this in people that take the Bible as a rule book uh, for the very sake only of coming to these practical moral principles rather than seeing it as uh, leading us to know uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit better. Number four for the Romans was the juridical element. Uh, page 247 in the book, again quoting from Borrow, the ability to abstract an essential characteristic is part of the mental process of the lawyer. The Romans showed the capacity to isolate the important and to pursue its applications. Hence their jurisprudence, and I would describe that as legalistic or even penal form of theology. Parental authority was strict, not to say severe. Education was given by the parent was practical. Even stories of the past were so framed as to point a moral. And the 12 tables of law were learned by heart. Now to understand that these uh, 12 tables of law, these were a Roman creation. Uh, you might compare these tables of law of the Romans with the uh, covenants, uh, the old covenant itself and all the commandments written down in that code. So here we have this description, 248 in the book, of the Roman 12 tables uh, as an example of Roman legalism. The 12 tables was a set of laws inscribed on 12 bronze tablets. Well, think of that, 12. It was created in ancient Rome in 451 and 450 BCE. The list of laws seems to have covered most areas of private law and concentrated on relations between individuals. Family law was also part of the 12 tables with rules regarding marriage, guardianship, inheritance, and funerals prevalent. Uh, just think of how that compares with how detailed the uh, old covenant laws were dealing with all these aspects of the Jewish life. And now I hope you can see kind of the connection between this Roman mentality and the Jewish one. So when the Romans had Christianity introduced them, of course they gravitated to that Jewish uh, the Old Covenant, nature. Number five, stern and dedicated. This is on page 248. Again, quoting Borrow. First, in every category of Roman virtues comes some recognition that a man should admit his subordination to something external, which has, quote, binding power, end quote, upon him. And the term for this, religio, and you, I hope you recognize in that uh, our English word religion has wide application. Gravitas means a sense of the importance of matters in hand, a sense of responsibility and earnestness. Gravitas is often associated with constantia, <clears throat> that is, firmness of purpose, or with firmitas, tenacity. Disciplinina is the training which produces steadiness of character. Industria, or hard work. Virtuous, virtus, is manliness and energy. Clementia, the willingness to forego one's rights, frugalitas, simple taste. Perhaps they can all be summed up under severitas, which means being stern with oneself. So we find the very roots in this culture itself. 
And I think you might even think that there are people that by their own nature find it easy to follow these stern practices. And uh, therefore they have a tendency towards a legalistic religion and of course that's why they're so centered in uh, legalistic understanding of the scriptures. So let me wrap up now with our uh, summary from chapter seven part A and just remind you that in this chapter we were focusing on cultural influences that will continue into the history of the church next week. So number one, I began this chapter addressing why a historic perspective is needed. The written expression of God's revelation, that is the Bible that we read of in our English translations of the Bible, of himself and his work, and in his reconciling and joining us into his divine family through rebirth and our participatory union and transformation is image and what I've called New Covenant Oneness has come to us not only in a different language, now in English, than originally recorded in Hebrew and Greek, but also through different cultural lenses that have influenced our theologies and our biblical translations over time. Number two, I referenced Jesus' warning found in all three synoptic gospels, so it must have been important to beware the teachings of Pharisees and Sadducees, by extension being extended being wearing of mixing Roman or Pharisaical teachings and Greek or Sadducee cultural influences into Christianity, influences that largely replace Hebraic biblical apostolic roots in the Western, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox churches, respectively. Three, I propose that there were three roots going back even the time of Christ. You see here on the screen, Pharisees, that Pharisaical uh, reliance on law and code and doing everything right is clearly seen in Romans and also seen in conservative Christians uh, theology. Uh, B, the Sadducees uh, who were more uh, humanistic and didn't put great reliance on uh, law. We see that influencing the Greeks who were philosophers uh, and so on, uh, and le bleeds over into contemporary liberal Christianity, who are also, by and large, secularists. And see Hebraic biblical culture seen in the early church when we looked at Ephesus, where we see these components of New Covenant Atonement and what I consider to be authentic, early, scripturally-based Christianity. Number four, I encouraged <clears throat> you to read my book, neither Pharisee conservative nor Sadducee liberal B, for more clarity and depth. So number five, I describe Hebraic biblical culture that is integral part of the new covenant understanding of a woman with these traits. Covenant, corporate identity, ongoing divine revelation, full of the Holy Spirit, a passionate God, dynamic versus static, narrative and symbolic understanding, holistic, and uh, understands resurrection. We see these contrasted with what we looked at in terms of the Greek traits, cultural traits, that lead to a liberal and even secularized Christianity that bleeds the spiritual life from the church as being individualism, theoretical naturalism, speculative philosophy versus divine revelation, dualistic, static, humanistic, and affirms the immortality of the soul. Number seven, then we looked at the Roman culture, which had elements that lead to a formal conservative, even legalistic religion, which is identified with parts of uh, Christianity and had these traits being practical versus theoretical, ritualistic, pragmatically moralistic, juridical, stern, and dedicated. So I hope in all this you can appreciate that when we look at how we've practiced Christianity in our own personal lives, in the churches we've been identified with and in the West, uh, we may have been influenced to a greater degree than we understood before by some of these cultural traits, which may not even be scriptural. But even the way we translate our Bibles and the way we understand things are always conditioned somewhat by these cultural tendencies we have. They can be overcome in the Holy Spirit. So I'm not suggesting that, that we're stuck, but we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to bring forth uh, meaning to us in our current life and living. So now I'm going to, next week we'll be continuing on in se chapter 7, part B, where we'll be actually looking at the history, and this is the historical development of atonement theories in the church. So let's end with this uh, final prayer as I do every week. Uh, Lord, may we see you more clearly. May we love you more dearly. 
May we follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen.